<laughs> yeah, you can take a couple minutes to come and get together there. I'm Pastor Randy Nelson. Uh, you've probably not heard of, uh, heard of me, uh, but I'm the AFLC Director of Evangelism and Discipleship. And uh, I'll be starting my fourth year in that role, uh, beginning next week, actually. And while that sounds like it's almost a long time, it's not. <laughs> and I can really appreciate, you know, with Pastor Micah, just, what, like three months now, maybe two? Four months, four months. There's a lot to get used to and stuff. Uh, so anyways, I am uh, glad to be here with you uh, this morning. Um, I, I, before becoming the Director of Evangelism and Discipleship, I was a parish pastor for the AFLC, uh, serving congregations uh, for 25 years in uh, Texas uh, and Illinois and in Kansas. Now, and I can see your eyes rolling. You're going, <laughs> we have churches there? Yeah, <laughs> just like you guys here in, in Arizona. And in fact, I, I often describe myself as a domestic missionary. So yeah, I didn't have the privilege of uh, growing up in the, in the Holy Land or serving churches in the Holy Land. That's what they call it up there, Minnesota, North Dakota, <laughs> South Dakota, that area there. Obviously, they don't come here very often, or then when they come here, they don't talk about it a lot, right? But anyways... Uh, as I said, I was a pastor for 25 years now, starting uh, my fourth year with this. A uh, little bit of my background here. I've been married 37 years. This is my clan, my, my group here. Uh, my wife, Brenda, who's with me today, uh, we met at an LEM gospel team a lot of years ago. Some of you know, what, are you familiar with LEM? Yeah? I, uh, we met on, on that team. We have uh, six children. Oh, I'm sorry, Lutheran Evangelistic Movement. It was, it was a ministry that began early in the, in the I think, late 50s, 60s, and 70s. And uh, we had a summer gospel team. And uh, I uh, persuaded her. Actually, that's, I, I, you're not supposed to do it that way, I'm told. Uh, marry people off your gospel team. But you did that too? <laughs> Praise God. I mean, what better way, right? You're living, on a, on, you're living with them for 12 weeks on the road, all that stuff. You can survive that. And you still like each other. It, it, it's a good place to start, right? Well, anyways, um, yeah, so I am. Uh, I'm glad to be here with you. Uh, not just because of the weather. <laughs> this, I, I, I believe it or not, this was me Thursday. That's me. <laughs> so, yeah, we had, uh, well, you probably heard blizzard stuff. I think we only ended up with about 12 inches or so. So, by Minnesota, not, not so bad. Um, what's that? That's in, in Brooklyn Park, just just north side of the city there. Um, so, no, not just because of that, but I uh, 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 I wanted to talk about Pastor Mike a second, but I think I'm going to come back to that in a minute, so... Anyways, here before I, I forget where I'm going with this, I am really glad to be here with you this week, just because uh, well, I have a really good friend, Earl Cornyn, who was here with you a couple weeks ago, and he said, you're going to love the people here. You're going to love the people. They were just wonderful. They love the Lord. They're hungry, and they're interested in the things of, things of Jesus. And so I, I'm looking forward to this time to be in this Bible conference. Also, too, to just to share with you a little bit about our ministry, uh, not a lot of people know a lot about um, AFLC evangelism and discipleship, and so I'd like just to take a couple of minutes here and, and just introduce you to that. Hopefully, um, you saw we have a table with some materials uh, out front there, and we'll talk about that in a minute here. Uh, but our mission is has been redefined, because uh, there was a point there where the question, what, what do we have evangelism and discipleship for? What is that? What do we do? Our mission is to encourage, equip, and assist our AFLC congregations and pastors in making and equipping disciples who make and equip disciples. We recognize you're the, you're the front lines, the, the local congregation, your churches, you're the where stuff happens. And so my job is to try and be out, help, support, equip, provide training, uh, provide materials, things that we can do to help you do that better and, and be more efficient in it. I just want to share a couple of things that we're, uh, we're going through right now. Um, one of the things we invested heavily in in the last couple of years is improving our website. And if you'll see that there, that's aflc.org slash evangelism. And if you'll, 
make sure to take one of these with you. You'll see it has the website on there. Also describes a little bit about our ministry. There's also a, a QR code that you can look with your phone. It'll take you right to there as well. Once you get there, you'll find a great deal of new resources. One of the things we're really excited about that we did is developing an evangelism and discipleship library. Uh, it's filled with a variety of materials, free materials you can download. Uh, we ask uh, members to share books that they read, their reviews and things that they like, uh, experiences. Uh, there's a variety of things you can go to, uh, including um, that uh, the handbook, the discipleship manual. I think that, I, that you saw someone here picked up one. Uh, that's actually, you can download that alone. Down. Yeah, exactly. You can download that free. Uh, it's right on our website if you like, because uh, we want you to use that stuff. One of the areas, too, that we are expanding in and, and feel like, uh, you know, as we just went through COVID, figuring out how do we best support our churches? How do we, how do we best come alongside? And, and what, we do, what we've found after talking to a lot of pastors and congregations is they want to feel equipped. They, they want to be better at what they're doing. Um, every congregation shrunk in numbers in, in the people who attend. But what we found is the people who have remained, that core, they're hungry and they're committed. And they really want to be better at making and equipping disciples. And so uh, one of the things that we have developed is uh, what's called our weekend equipping workshops. We're right in the process right now of, uh, of a longer version. One, it's, it actually covers three, uh, three months, but it's, called, it's uh, based on... Uh, Becoming a, uh, equipping, living as a disciple in a post-Christian America. That's the theme. That's the title. And, and, and it's over those three months, we walk you through a number of, uh, of equip, equipping parts, beginning with from being a, uh, learning what it means to be a disciple, loving, uh, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Equipping you, how to share your faith effectively, and, 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 and giving you some tools that you can do that. And then also understanding, too, what post-Christian America means. What is it? How is that affecting us? Why is it so hard for us? Or what, what's the things that we have to overcome? What's the narrative we have to change so that people will actually be open to and, and hear the gospel and we can reach them? And so that and a number of other areas, too, that we're uh, looking at, including uh, church leadership development and other things as well. If you look at, again, and go to that website and look up uh, that particular section on the uh, weekend equipping workshops, you'll see a lot more details in that as well. Finally, last thing is uh, rekindle the fire. Uh, that's an a event we do each year and have done uh, right before annual conference. And in the past, it's been uh, primarily just for pastors and their, and their wives. But we feel like everybody really needs to be equipped, needs to be encouraged and uh, how, how to reach the world for Christ. And so this year, we are opening up to everyone, inviting uh, pastors and lay people and, and everyone to come. Uh, it'll take place on that uh, Tuesday before. It'll be at uh, Living Word uh, Free Lutheran Church there in Sioux Falls. The title of this year's theme is uh, Sharing Jesus in Post-Christian America. I'm really excited about uh, having some of the, the speakers that we do. One is uh, Brady Arneson who is uh, a lay pastor who has helped heart started uh, the, our church in Hawaii on Waikiki Beach, the, mo the fastest growing church we have, and, and the things that he has learned. And he'll be sharing some of that. Also, uh, former uh, AFLC uh, Youth Ministries Director and now PMA, Presidential Ministry Advisor, no, uh, Associate. No, Associate? Okay, yeah. He's, he's Micah's right hand, uh, and, we're, and they are doing a great job, by the way. Anyways, uh, but uh, Jason will be coming and talking about that and sharing, too, about how do, what, what's, what are signs, how do, we, how do we reach this next generation with the gospel? And then I'll talk as well, too, but come for that. If you are coming to annual conference, just consider maybe coming a day earlier and coming and being a part of this. It's free. There's no charge. We'll feed you a really nice meal. Uh, afterwards, and uh, I, I know you'll be blessed. So thanks for giving me the opportunity just to give a little brief um, uh, commercial there. Also, too, we have these really cool keychains. Everybody needs keychains. Be sure to 
I don't want to take any back. So make sure you, you pick that up as well. well I wanted to say, um, here's what I want to talk about. Growing deep is the, the topic I was given. And uh, you know, I, I'm excited about being able to come and share this with you. But before I begin, I want to talk about what I call a God sighting. And I don't know if you probably are, maybe uh, your pastor's talked about that. I'm sure Pastor Clayton has. Um, where you see God work, right? And we, we need to do a better job of seeing and identifying those and recognizing them. I, I, I like the journal and mark them down. Because it's, it's a great reminder that God is working. Um, and it was just as I was sitting there listening to Pastor Micah's message, I'm thinking about, all right, we talked together a month ago, right? Four or five weeks ago. We spent maybe a half hour. We prayed and talked, looked at, decided on a scripture. And that's the last time we talked. And, and I'm just amazed that as I, as I was listening to him lay down his message and all that, I'm like, wow, that's perfect. That, that, is, that lays down what a wonderful foundation for a lot of things that were at, what God's laid on my heart. And, and I hope you're going to agree as you go through and see just, um, just how, how clearly God guides and directs that. I, too, just wanted to take a moment. That's what I wanted to get at was say, I'm so thankful for our new, our new president. And I'm thankful you're 40. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You know, as someone who's been there and, and watched and, and just how he's come in and conducted himself and, and really just uh, worked really hard, he and Jason as well too, but in addressing a number of things, but just uh, his energy and power. He, what he didn't tell you is that you spent, what, like four or five days last week on another West Coast trip, right? Uh, how, I don't know how long that was, but anyways, he just flew in and flew in during the middle of the, of the uh, blizzard on Thursday. Right, and then you heard all his fun last night. So, thankfully, you are going to get a couple of days here afterwards, right, to to rest with you and your family. So, I do, I do, and genuine, and this is from my heart. Please pray for our president. Pray for him and our leadership. And because what I just said, I know that's Micah's heart as well too. We see our role as helping and supporting you. Our what we. We used to say when Pastor Linden was our president, he used to say it's a, it servant quarters, but that that really what it is. We 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 serve you. Our job is to help stand up, support, encourage, equip, provide the things that you need so you can be better at what you do as you reach the gospel. You're on the front lines, and, and honestly, uh, if we can be of anything, any support or help, we do want you to come and and express that to you, or express that to us is what I meant. All right, let's talk about getting deep. Deep is a cool word, isn't it? We, we like deep. It's a word that fits well in our culture. I don't know if you ever thought about that or why that is. But, but you know what? If you add deep in front of almost anything, it makes it cooler, right? Right? You go, like, like for example, water, right? And then we go, Deep water. Ooh, that's a, that's, a, that's a whole lot better, right? Or even just blue. Okay, that's blue. That's a nice color, blue. Deep blue. Ooh, right? Or pastor. Yeah, pastor. Then you go, deep pastor. Yeah. Right? Okay, so maybe not everything. <laughs> but, but what is it about deep that attracts us? Maybe I think it's because it's the opposite of shallow or superficial. Maybe because deep seems to imply commitment, maturity, stability. And in many cases, that's been our experience, hasn't it? Uh, that, that, that's, that's true of depth. Uh, for most of us, growing deep carries the idea of digging in, of being committed, of pursuing something that isn't easy, but we know that it's worth the effort, which is a principle that we see consistently throughout, uh, throughout the scriptures, especially when we're thinking and talking about God, right? There is nothing shallow about God. God is the ultimate in deep. Uh, God is deep in, in, in who he is, his character, in his commitment, in his love for us. 
absolutely, actually anything you can think of to describe God, he has the full depth of everything that is good that we can think of. And depth is an attribute uh, that's desired by those who want to be like him. So this morning, uh, as we're looking at, at Psalm 1, which serves as a, a brief introduction to the book of Psalms, and I really appreciate how Pastor Mike laid all that out um, and, and talking about how uh, it sums up the, the primary distinctions of this life, those who follow God and those who don't. Uh, we also find two keys to growing deep spiritually. And so I'd, I'd like us to look at this text here, um, again, verses 1 through 3. And, and yeah, I'll, I'll just read that for us. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his meditation. On his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Now, Pastor Micah walked us through a little bit of that at the beginning part there, but I I want us to focus on that metaphor of of a tree. Um, Now, one of the things I noticed when I was down here, didn't see a lot of them. Right on our, on our drive up here, maybe I missed them, but but not a lot of them. But I, I've lived in different parts uh, of the country. I love trees. I, I like them. I don't pretend that I know a lot about them. I, I do know that there's a wide variety. Of, oh, I forgot to advance that. Sorry. Here we go. There are a wide variety of trees, though, and, and often depending on the climate and the soil and other factors, right? They they vary dramatically. You know, one of the things when we lived in Texas, as I found it interesting, is that just because a tree grows tall, it, it doesn't mean it has deep roots. Um, if there is good soil or regular moisture and a comfortable climate, trees can grow very tall, but their root system is not very deep. In fact, it can be quite shallow. And when they face strong winds, it can be uprooted fairly easily. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen anything like that. I thought that was pretty amazing. But but trees that are massive uh, can be can be uprooted. Well, that's not the climate. That's not the kind of trees that are that someone is is thinking of, and and the the psalmist is writing about there. That's not what he has in mind. Uh, he's more familiar with a harsh land, a place with little moisture, scorching heat something you guys probably are familiar with here in Arizona, I would, I would assume. Here, uh, he's describing something that looks more like this. Uh, and he's talking about specifically in, in our text here, a tree that has stretched its roots deep into the soil alongside a flowing stream. Here, the tree finds an abundant supply of life-giving water a supply that enables the tree to not only stand strong, but then to produce fruit in due season. It remains evergreen, and at it least its leaves never wither. Now, my experience is that it's rare to find that, right? But this is something also that God describes as something that's possible and, and, and describes the life of the one who, who pursues him, who, who loves him who loves his law. Well, let's go ahead and unpack this a little bit. Our picture is a metaphor for the man. This was described in verse 1 as blessed or blessed. And he's blessed in many ways. And and as Pastor Micah talked about, he doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked. He doesn't stand in the way of sinners nor sits in the seat of scoffers. And I appreciate how he laid that out, but also, too, make sure we catch the idea that, that it's a progressive thing, and it's easily. We, we live in a fallen world, right? Everything around us is, is pursuing a different agenda, different idea, different plan than what God has laid forth in his word. And so it's easy to get drawn into. And, and so as we see there, there, it's easy to kind of be drawn along where we start off at the beginning, where we're just listening and taking these ideas of the wicked 
uh, and then we start to, 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 to stand in those and, and sink our heels in, as he said. And then we get to the point where we're even making fun of those who, who, who pursue godly principles and standards. The point here is he's, he's not like the world. Blessed is this one who, whose life is different. His actions are disciplined. He lives by a different set of values and principles than those who are around him. Uh, in one of the commentaries I looked up, at, Dr. Donald Williamson says, his worldview, his ethical life, and his moral decisions are no longer dictated by the godless. His identity, his standing, his lifestyle are no longer determined by those in rebellion against God. And he neither learns nor judges from the perspective of those bearing the acid authority of cynicism and pride. And of this person, we read, right, verse 3 says, In all that he does, he prospers. All that he does prospers, which tells us that the things that he is doing that are guiding him, that are guarding his path, that are allowing him to enjoy the fullness and blessings of life, like a fruitful tree deeply rooted against the harsh environment of the world he lives in. These come from something, right, that, that, that's different than everybody else. So how does this man grow deep? Verse 2 says, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He has an attitude of delight in the law of the Lord, which leads him to an action. In his law he meditates day and night. Now, as you think about that text, what are the things that you delight in? What do you delight in? The Hebrew word here is kefetz, and it comes from the word for pleasure. Uh, Strong's Dictionary says that uh, concretely, kefetz is something of great value. In English, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary says that as a verb, it means to bring great pleasure. What are the things that you delight in? I took some time to wrestle with that, obviously, in preparing for this. And I have to admit that as I began to think about all the things that I treasure, that I think are important in my life, I began to realize that there's a lot of things that I like, but I can't think of many things that I delight in. In fact, I like, I like my cars a lot. I, I'm a car guy. I'm into that. I like music a lot. I like sitting on my back deck looking out over the park. Those are all things that I can, I can do for hours and be happy and content. Those are things. But I found that really the only thing I delight in that gives me great pleasure are people. I think if you think about that as well, you realize that it's, it's people that we delight in. Stuff, stuff is only temporary. It's only passing. Yeah, I honestly, and not just because she's sitting in the front row, but, and she didn't see me right that I wrote this, but my wife gives me great pleasure. Even just sitting next to her, I delight in her. She, just by her presence, she makes me better. I know that. My children and my grandchildren, it's amazing. I can just, I can just hang out and be with them. They don't even have to do things that I like because they like to do things I really don't like. <laughs> For those of you who have you know, children, grandchildren, right, they get to a point like, okay, I'm just glad to be in the room. You guys go do what's your thing and... But we just delight being with them, right? And I delight in God. 
And I delight in his word because he is his word. I, I can spend hours just thinking about God, praying, singing to him, worshiping him, reading the scriptures. I can confidently say I delight in him. He makes me better. He fills me and, and, and satisfies me like nothing else can. And the truth is, his word is like that as well. His word, he tells it's his very presence. He, he, he brings it alive. He, he speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. It's more than just a book. It is him. Now, I know that's, well, I'll be honest, as a pastor, sometimes it's hard because I'm often drawn to his word or I have to spend time in his word because it's my job, right? That's what I do. Uh, and I love preparing sermons. I love digging into the word. And you know what? And, and that's a fun thing to be able to pull all this together. But but what I find is that I really delight in just reading his word and just letting it speak to me. Even just small sections, small portions. It doesn't have to be big chunks. And really the big thing of it is realizing it's his word. It's what he is saying to me. When I let it really be his word, if that makes sense to you. I don't know if you ever thought about the scriptures in that way. I, I realize too that looking at a text like this, it's easy to kind of feel the sting of the law, right? What if I, what if I don't really delight in the word? I don't delight in the law of the word. And as Pastor Micah clearly explained earlier, he, he's describing all of Scripture, the whole message, not just the law portion, but the law, the gospel, all that we describe as the inspired Word of God. What if I don't delight in it? I get that. It's hard not to feel that way, that sting, to feel like reading God's Word is more of a burden and a chore than it is a delight. But what I can tell you is what, what changed for me is we begin to see it as not just words on a paper or something I have to do, but we see it as God's word to us. God's presence brought to us through his living word. You know, from that perspective, for those of us who are born again, who love the Lord, who, who we know that delight that comes from like being in a, in a time like this, right? Or when spending time in worship. Yeah, hopefully that's the feelings you have in your own congregation where you're there. Just that, that joy of, of feeling of the presence of God as, as he comes together, especially in the body of Christ, or even in those special times alone with him. That, that, that sense of his presence that, that calms your heart that ministers to your soul like nothing else, that, that's really gospel, that gospel salve, that, that healing ointment that just, that we love, that we live for, right? And then recognizing God's word is really that same thing, if we let it be. And the desire to meditate on it day and night then can... Move from being a burden, but rather a joy. So the first key we see to growing deep is to delight in God's word. As we would his very presence. To mentally change and transfer that, that, that view and perspective of it. Delight in God's word as we would his present. But the second key I want us to focus on here is to meditate on it day and night. Meditate on it day and night. Now, if you're like me, 
when you were growing up, there, there's a lot of word about uh, worry and concern about the word meditation, right? They wanted us to meditate. Like, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? We don't want to be doing that. And, and there was good reason for that. Back then, the concern was something called transcendental meditation. And it was a valid concern. Uh, it was a form of silent mantra meditation introduced by the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in India back in the mid-50s. And, and it was kind of making the circuits, right? Everybody was doing that. You meditate, mm, or whatever that, that thing was, right? Empty your brain. This isn't that. Th that's not what, what the psalmist is describing here, or what God wants for us. That's very different than what we see described in verse 2 here. Uh, that Hebrew word translated as meditate is hagah, and, and it means to utter uh, sounds, to speak. Uh, it often appears in Hebrew poetry as a synonym, synonym for zakar, uh, which means to remember or call to mind, as well as sia, which means to consider or to ponder. And so in many places we'll see scripture, all three of these will be together. We'll see that uh, hagah, utter sounds, Zakar, remember to call to mind, see, uh, to consider, or to ponder. And, and here's an example of that from Psalm 145, 43, verse 5. No, it is 145, verse 3, verses 4 and 5, uh, where he says, I remember the days of old. I meditate in all your works. I muse, or I ponder the work of your hand. Here well, we see a, one example here of these three words used together to define what, what he's talking about when he says to meditate. It means to recall and to think about all the things that God has said and done and to speak about them, to talk about them, in my, to my, even just to myself, just to, to remember and talk about them. And another simpler definition would be just to think deeply about God and his word. Uh, to take a portion of God's word and give yourself time to not only read it, but to dig into it. To read it in the context of the whole chapter. To take the time to look up key words in the text to better understand what they mean. To try and, and, and step away a little bit and hear it as someone in the crowd from that time and place and understand how they would have understood them. Here's the big key, to slow down and not just race through to get done, but to savor and reflect that all is revealed in God's word. Now, as simple and easy as that sounds, we have a serious problem today. And that is, how do we keep this from taking place? Because we, we, we don't read the scriptures often that way, right? It, we read it like, all right, I got, here's my devotion. I got to quick get this done. I got to read through this passage. And I need to, I need to I've, I've got other things I got to get to. And so I, I say, nope, I'm only going to give it this brief a time. And, and I, I kind of want to rush through it. it. It's actually something that I, I call... Uh, spiritual inoculation. And, and that problem is, is when we, we get inoculated, it then eventually leads to, to spiritual, immune, spiritual immunity where we miss out. Now, let me, let me explain that a little bit. One of the things that we do really well today is to take in and download a lot of information, sort through it, and get down to the real core of whatever it is we're consuming, Right? In fact, if you begin to study anything a little bit about um, post-Christian America or, or the next generation here, they're really good at that. They grew up with the internet. They're very good at looking at a whole lot of data and then condensing it. Here I get down to what's really the quick, what's the thing I need to know? What, what, what's, what's the bullet points of this? But the problem is that that doesn't work really good when it comes to spiritual truth. Not when it comes to God and his word. Because when we do that, we miss out. In fact, it has led to a real problem in spiritual growth and discipleship that, as I said, I call spiritual immunity. 
And it happens all the time to people who are trying to do the right thing, but are instead stunning their spiritual growth and their intimacy with God. And I will confess, I have fallen into this myself. As a pastor, it's really easy, right, to look at a text. Okay, here's the points. Here's the things I'm going to preach on. Boom, I'm going to go on and move on from that. I miss it. And we all can fall into it. In fact, here, let me give you another example. Whoops, not that. It goes like this. I want to grow in my relationship with God. So I have an app where it sends me a five-minute devotional every morning, right? I really like it. It gets my day started off right. In fact, what I found is that, you know, I actually have a little bit more time than that. So I've now added a second one, right? Then during the day, I work at a job where I can listen to Christian music and I even catch a couple of sermons, too. I really like Chuck Swindoll and David Jeremiah. They have great messages. And when I get home, uh, we, we try to all eat together, and we've started having a brief devotion together before everyone goes their own way. And I know the boys aren't thrilled with it, but at least they're hearing it. And on and on. Now, this, what I've just described, right, is what we saw. That sounds like it's pretty good. That's actually really healthy, right? In fact, we might all say, I, I wish I was more like that. But here's the problem. God and his word are much more than just knowledge to digest or information to consume. God and his word is much more than just knowledge to digest or information to consume. And when we treat them as such, we're actually spiritually inoculating ourselves from getting him, from getting what he really wants us to understand and hear and get from his word. And over time, as we continue to build this up in our spiritual life, we become spiritually immune to his word. Because here's what happened. In those times throughout the day where you hear God's word, right, while you're at work, you're listening to the sermon, you're also busy doing other things. You're focused in a lot of other ways. You're only partially listening. You're listening for the information. You're downloading the key materials, but you really weren't there. You're not really present with God. You didn't really hear from God because you weren't fully engaged. And the problem isn't with the quality of the message or the material. The problem was that because you weren't focused on who it was that was actually speaking to you, that it was God, you missed it. You missed what he was really saying to you. You were rushing on to other things and you didn't really get a chance to let it process, what, what does that mean for my life? What does that mean for my current situation? What are the things that he's really calling me to do? You miss God telling you the so what. Now, I'm not saying that happens every time. And you probably do get something from those brief encounters with God, but I'm telling you, you're missing out on what he really wants you to hear and to receive, what he wants you to get. You know, it's kind of like having a relationship with your wife, but all you ever do is text from a different place than she is. And you're never face to face, right? Now, if you can imagine that, can you get all the information that she's sending you? Kind of, right? The written part. You miss out on all the visual clues and all the other things and the facial expressions, which as a husband, I've learned is really important. Now, is that really a good relationship? No. Is that a relationship that's going to grow like that? Not hardly. And here's where the spiritual immunity part comes in. Because when you finally sit down with God and you have the time and you want to listen to what he has to share with you about the Lord's Prayer, 
or raising Lazarus from the dead or the fruits of the Spirit. You may be in tune. You may be listening. You're reading. But in your head, you're also going, okay. But you know what? I I already heard about this from Chuck Swindoll. (laughs) Or I I already have from my devotions to each other. I I know where you're going with this. I know what the applications are. I, I know all the key points. And we don't really hear what it is God is saying to us. You've already been inoculated. You get a little bit of it. It made you feel uncomfortable for 30 seconds, uh, but then you went on. But now the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you something that you really need to understand intimately. He's trying to explain to you a truth that applies to you in a way that's, that's important so that real spiritual growth can occur. But the Holy Spirit has to fight through the immunity that you've built up because in your head, you already know what this is all about. You already know the right answers to this portion of Scripture. You already know what you think God is telling you. That's spiritual immunity. And the hard truth is that it's, Severely hindering spiritual growth in a lot of our churches today. So how do we overcome it? How do we overcome spiritual immunity? We meditate on God's word. It's been there right in front of us all along. We build time into our lives with God through his word to receive what he has for us. It's been a hard lesson for me, honestly. How easy it has been to just, okay, I got to get this part done, and I, and I cut that short. But you're really hurting yourself, especially if what you're desiring is to grow deep in your relationship with God. To build time in, to not just get the highlights, but the subtle parts that reveal who God is. What he is really saying to you. And what he wants you to get out of that intimate time with him. We take the time to be with him. And and to recall and think about all that God has said and done. We take the time to think deeply about God and his word. Now, don't get me wrong. We can still and should still have daily devotions and appreciate Christian music and preaching. There is a value and a point for that. But understand as well, too that if we really can't give our full attention to something like that and allow for some quiet time with God to really speak to us about it, we may actually be doing more harm than good. So how do I avoid spiritual inoculation and develop good meditation practices? First, to begin with, be mindful of how you're approaching any time with God through his word. It's easy for us to not think about who it is that we're coming to when we open up our Bible or we read a devotion or we listen to a message. Even if I don't like the preacher or I don't think, I think he's boring, whatever. That's not who you're listening to. You are spending time with the living God. And the word that you hear proclaimed is God. And we're coming into the presence of the living God when we are looking to his word. And it's helpful for us to remember that each time we come, to make that a part of our mindset. Next, make it a practice to give God your full attention. Again, we all know it's easy, right, to get distracted by other things, especially when we come to church. We open our Bibles, especially if you're like me, who I, I've switched, I've I found it's easier to read my read scripture off my phone, iPhone, right? Because I can I can make the print bigger, I can make the uh, the I can make the, the the backlighting better, so I can see it in the dark and all that. But it's dangerous to have your iPhone sitting there as you're going right, and the, and the pastor is wandering off into some story, and you're going, yeah, what is, my phone just ding? What is, what else? Other messages there or something, or what else? Or, or maybe I'm smarter than him. Maybe I should go ahead and look up. I've got another app on my phone that has uh, commentary. Maybe I should look and see what he really should be saying. I'm just speaking as a preacher, okay? Some of my temptations, my failings. It's easy to get distracted. 
right? How, what we should do then is to give him our full attention, make it a practice to take notes, to follow along in our Bible and commit to stay engaged. And, and, and if you do, it's going to be easier for God to speak to you and for you not to get distracted. And I didn't mean that I skipped over that part there, but taking notes is really critical, really helpful. And you can do that on your phone too. I just open up a message to myself and then I, I just... That email, I, I'm going to send out to myself. I put my notes in there, my message to that, to me. So it's later, again, to keep me focused on what is happening right here. I, am, I have time with the living God. I shouldn't be doing other things. I need to give him my full attention. Uh, third, make time after any spiritual intake to be quiet with God. Another benefit uh, to taking notes, it makes it easier to come to God later and meditate what he's already spoken to you about through his word. I, I've made that kind of a thing for me now Sunday afternoon. And I know, even as I'm there and I think I'm paying attention, I'm really not. But I do have those notes now, and I make that part of my thing Thursday, Sunday afternoons now to look back over, what did I really get out of this? What, what was it that God was really speaking to me here? Taking that time to every time we hear from God, whether it's after church or your devotions or just reading your Bible, make sure you always leave yourself enough time uh, just to be quiet and listen. If we do that, it'll bring balance uh, and our natural practice uh, against our, our natural practice just getting the facts and encourage us to contemplate deeper uh, what those facts mean practically. Making this a practice not only deepens those times of meditation, but they also uh, reinforce the value of staying focused when you are in his word. And then finally, document your spiritual lessons and responses. One of the things I've done throughout my life, and sometimes I was really good at it, and sometimes I've dropped out, but one thing I've always known was good is to journal, to have a spiritual journal. I log my lessons and takeaways. I log my God sightings, as I mentioned earlier those times where God speaks to me through the word or through events or things where I can log it and I keep track of, here's what happened. And I thought it was amazing. But it also, too, serves as a great reminder to me later as I go back and reflect on those, especially during difficult times. I can see, here's, here's where God, he did this. I saw it. And now even six months later, and I can see the continuing uh, uh, results and benefits from that. Uh, it also... Uh, Important highlights the scriptures that God speaks to you through. Write those down. Uh, you, you can post them on your bathroom mirror. My wife does that. Uh, memorize them. Uh, writing it down makes it real. I, I need to hit that because that's a really big, important thing, especially in our home. My wife has taught us all that. At our house, when you need something, there's a notepad that lives on the refrigerator door, right? Uh, if you need something that you don't write it down on that paper, that's on you. <laughs> that's your problem. Mom will even tell you, don't tell me about it, write it down. And if it's not written down, it didn't happen. <laughs> and and it's, you know, it's a good lesson for all of us, me and the kids. We all learned that. And, and it's true here as well. If we don't write it down, it, it, it doesn't stick very well. Uh, these reminders, again, can be great boost to our faith in tough times. Uh, writing it down also clarifies it in your mind. When you take the time, you know, you have this thought, you know, oh, yeah, I got that. But when I take the time to write it down, it not only helps you to process it and clarify it, uh, it, it makes it something that you can grab onto easier in your mind. Writing it down helps you to remember. Uh, part of meditation is remembering and replaying the things that God has done. If you write it down in a journal, you can go back later and remember more clearly what happened because you wrote it down. Now, I know that everybody in this room knows, understands very clearly that uh, writing things down is helpful, right? Because nobody in this room has ever walked into a room and goes, why am I here? What, <laughs> what am I doing here? What happened? Sometimes, yeah, maybe we should keep a notepad with us all the time, right? But no, if we write it down, it helps us to remember and then writing it down also expresses your faith in and your love for God. 
when we take the time to write it down, it not only expresses faith that it was God who spoke to us or did something in our life, it can also encourage your faith when you look back on it and see the things that have happened since then, many times in ways you never imagined. And this one just uh, came to me the other day. It's also a great expression of love towards God because you're writing down what he has spoken to you. you. Just think about it this way. Imagine how your spouse would feel if you took the time to write down the neat things that she said to you or he said to you or the thoughtful gifts that he gave to you. Our writing down our thoughts and about our personal times with God are a wonderful expression of the love we have for God that blesses him and us. So obviously, I'm a big fan of journaling. Journaling, and I'd encourage you to try that. I'd also encourage you to know that journals don't have to be an everyday thing. Is it valuable? Yes. Uh, but also, you know what? Life gets busy, you forget to do it, and you let it go. And then you begin to feel guilty. It's like, man, I let it go for a week. Now what do I do? Do I have to make all that stuff up? Do I have to try and remember? I would suggest, and what I found is, you know, just start from where you are. It's all right. God, God knows. He understands you. What's more important is that you keep up the practice, that you keep doing it, and you'll be glad you did. So, all right, I'm probably, was there a time clicker, time countdown? Yeah, cool. All right, I just go to, we're going to keep going. Now, <laughs> as we close, uh, I do, I hope your big takeaways here is that growing deep spiritually is really about growing in your relationship with God. That it comes from a love for God that understands that he has given us his word as a means to know him personally and intimately. A holy word that is empowered by the Holy Spirit to take us right to the core of our loving God. It is a precious gift that's able to connect us to him in ways far beyond what most would ever even consider. If we let it. If we let it. And I've still learned this. If we let it. Friends, let me encourage you to follow the example of what we saw in this blessed man in Psalm 1. Allow God's word to become a delight to your life. Make the time to meditate upon it day and night. And if you will, God declares that all that you do will prosper. Would you pray with me, please? Loving God, how good it is for us to have spent this time this morning with you. And honestly, God, I can say I have felt your presence here. And just as your word declares, where two or more are gathered, you are here in the midst of us. We thank you for that. We thank you as well, too, for your living word that is so much more than just a book. It's way more than just a bunch of laws and rules. It is you. It is made alive and active by your Holy Spirit. It is able to speak to the very deepest parts of our hearts and lives, uh, to the very needs that we have, and it's able to equip us, able to counsel us, able to comfort us because your Holy Spirit applies it right to us. Lord, honestly, as, as we contemplate these things and we learn them in our heads, Lord, we pray, teach them, teach these to, to feel them and know them in our hearts and to recognize the greatest thing, the biggest thing we should take away from this is just the need to spend time with you, to make that time with you, with your word. And to learn to delight in your word by recognizing how it makes us feel, by, by, by teaching us that oh, this is really good when we spend that time with you. We've come away different because we've been with you. Help us to not only think it's a good thing, but to delight in it. Or that it would have its way in us. Lord, teach us then to meditate on it day and night in all that we do. Lord, to make that time, to let it really become a part of who we are. Lord, to your honor and glory. And Lord, and to give us the rich, full life you desire. 
Lord, we thank you for this time today. Thank you for all those who have come and traveled. Thank you for those who have watched online. And Lord, we just ask your blessing on each one now. Lord, may we, may we just uh, rejoice in this and go confident that the living God loves us. And he's demonstrated through his, his one and only son who came and died for us that all who would place their faith and trust in him would have the assurance of eternal life. Lord, we thank you for these things. We ask you to bless us as we go in Jesus' name. Amen. We'd really, truly like to thank Pastor Randy, Pastor Micah, and Sherry for coming here. This is the first time Joy Church has done something like this, to have a Bible conference. And quite frankly, I would love to do it annually. Uh, if we could do that and, and uh, spread the word, I would love that. I know you're just working on a few hours of sleep here, so <laughs> I'll talk to you later maybe about that. <laughs> but thank you for coming. Uh, you don't have to leave right away. Uh, feel free to talk, mingle, and have fellowship, and there's a few more treats. God bless. Thank you. <laughs>